Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. For this conversation, we were lucky enough to bring back Richard Eyer for a second episode, this one focusing on his book, The Happiness Paradox. We love the book and thought that this discussion would be really timely for the new year, since so many of us are hoping to find new paradigms that will help us to live in healthier and happier ways. We think that Richard's book does just that. For those unfamiliar with Richard from our last episode with him, he's had an extraordinary career as an author, consultant, entrepreneur, and speaker. He's the author of more than 50 books, many written along with his wife, Linda. Richard and Linda are among America's most prominent voices on the subject of parenting, and together they wrote Teaching Your Children Values, which was a number one New York Times bestseller. They and their work have appeared on Oprah, the CBS Early Morning Show, Today, Good Morning America, and many other national media outlets. Richard's also experienced wide-ranging church service, including serving as the president of the England-London South Mission, and he and Linda served as external advisors to the church on family. We're excited to share this episode with you. We'll get into the details once the conversation starts, but Richard's book taps into some of the most counterintuitive and vital ideas from the great wisdom and religious traditions of the world, including our own. We want to extend a huge thanks to Richard for coming on again and spending some more time with us. We hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Okay, Richard Iyer, thank you so much for coming back and, uh, and joining us on the here. podcast. This time on a book that is actually written. <laughs> yes, no, and, and it's, a, it's a, a wonderful book, I will say that. And I will say the, the most striking thing, I'm holding the book in my hands for, the, for the, um, those that are just listening and not watching. Um, the most striking thing about this book uh, on first glance is that it has two front covers. Right. Uh, if you flip it over upside down, you, you get a slight, so the happiness paradox right. on the front side. On the on the back side, it's another front cover that that says the happiness paradigm, the and end that's is just in the middle. Both ends are in the middle. <laughs> yes, and I was gonna say, and the covers are just the uh, j- that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole there's a whole reason uh, behind why you why you did this. Would you would you mind telling us a little bit about the background of this book? And no, I'm happy to. In fact, I'll I'll tell you. If I, I would have never thought to say this, but the first book I ever wrote when I was just still a student at the Harvard Business School was a book that flipped over. Yes. Oh, really? And, was, yeah. and Stephen M. R. Covey writes about this in the foreword, yeah. saying that he saw yeah, it. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Seen it. And the reason was I was co-authoring it, and we we didn't know whether to call it "I Challenge You" or "I Promise You." Are people more interested in being challenged, or are they more interested in promises? Yeah. And we decided let's do it both ways, and they can read it from either side. And that was a long time ago, and yeah. so. When it came time to write this one, I thought I'm going to do that again. You know, it is really unique. I had never, I had never seen it before. Why waste a cover on being the back cover? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what what inspired you to to write to write this book? Well, I, I to be honest, there was a, a prequel to this book, another book that we did, I did some years ago called The Three Deceivers, mm-hmm. and I was uh, we were doing a lot of speaking at the time, and one of our main topics was life balance, and and for for years Linda and I were trying to teach people how to plan better and how to set better goals and so on, and and we came to a stark realization that the problem wasn't so much that they didn't know how to set goals or how to plan. The problem was they didn't really, the problem was that they wanted the wrong things. The mm. problem was that they were preconditioned to think that that they wanted things or that there were certain things that would make them happy. And the more I thought about it, the more I felt they were not only wrong, they were flipped upside down. And that was another wow. reason for the book is the, the metaphor that the, the happiness paradox essentially means the very things people collectively as a society thought would make them happier actually robbing us of our happiness and we would see this in a lot of situations and and we could identify what those things were and, and let me just say this too because this will go through our whole conversation we we were not interested in writing this book to the church we were interested in writing it to the broader world where we thought the biggest problem existed and what we were really trying to write was a book about guidance by the Spirit, a book about letting God prevail or having His goals run our lives rather than our own goals, and a a book about humility and being dependent on God. But Mm. these are very religious concepts, very spiritual concepts, and I was caught up and challenged and actually sort of obsessed with the idea of can we say that in words that are secular, even almost business words, even because the, most of our speaking was to, to corporate groups and so on. We wanted a book that 
they could grab onto. And, and not, e not even an Oprah type book, not even a, a sort of spiritual, but not religious mm -hmm. sort of, you know, it's just out there and, and mindfulness and so on. Business guys don't read those much either. You know, we, we wanted something that would really apply. So I knew what I thought the deceivers were. I thought the deceivers were control, ownership, and independence. Now, if you want to take on three formidable opponents, mm -hmm. and, and I did one thing one day that I, you'll find interesting. I was in New York, and I went in. The, there's this huge Barnes & Noble on Fifth <laughs> Avenue. And I went in, and I went to this massive self-help section, big. And I, I, was, I had enough time that I was trying to say, what are the main sort of implied objectives here, you know, regardless of what kind of techniques they're talking about. What are the assumed reasons you do these things? What are you trying mm -hmm. to get? Those are the three. Getting yeah. more control, yep. getting more ownership, getting yeah. more wealth, you know, being more successful, and becoming more independent. Yeah. Right. And, and at first glance, you say, well, of course those are good things. That's what we teach our children. We want our children to control their tempers. We want our children to you know, um, be independent and not need us all the time and so on. And I, I just kept feeling more and more, yeah, those are those are good lessons, but those are lessons for children. Right. Yeah. They're not lessons for adults. Because yeah. think of you, yourself as an adult now. What do you really control? Let's get real here. Let's get honest. How much control do you really have? Come on. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and, and how much frustration do you feel when you're trying to control everything and everybody, including something as simple as your schedule, which you can't even control? Yeah. Right. And it begins to lap over into trying to control your children in lots of ways, control your associates, control your life. Mm -hmm. And it, it just leads to all kinds. Of, and the reason it does is it's a false concept, I think. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking as a gospel thought now. I know that we don't control. I know God control, but I'm not going to say that in the book. I'm trying to say <laughs> right. this in a secular way. Right. But I know control is one of the culprits. Ownership. Yeah. You know, we know in the church we don't own anything, but you can't say that in a book that's a secular book. So you have to say things like, imagine two trees, okay? This, this tree has a trunk called ownership. What are the limbs on it? Pride, I got more than you. Right. Jealousy. Jealousy, I got Very, less than you. Yeah. Condescension, <laughs> you know, all, yeah. I mean, what are the tree? Now, what if we could find another tree, but I haven't got to it yet because one of the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the techniques was don't tell what yeah. the three alternatives are yet because right. first step is people have to dissuade themselves. Yeah, you have to these, be troubled. Yeah, you got to yeah. you got to say, wow, maybe I, maybe, I, maybe that is wrong, you know. Yeah. And third one, in a way, is the easiest to dispel. Independence? Mm. What are you independent of? Yeah. You know, we're completely interdependent, more so in this world than ever before. Yeah. And and I want to say dependent on God, too, but I'm not going to say that because it's so. So I, I felt like first you have to take enough time and give enough examples that people at least. And again, I mean, independence, that's that's on our flag um you know mm -hmm. control th these are big things to take on but if you can just get under people's skin enough to say i see where those are good economic concepts uh, ownership drives a free enterprise system right control drives a, a society that tries to obey laws and so on so you know they're they're fine but let's not make them. Let's not make them the way we run our lives, mm -hmm. because we'll be frustrated. We'll be unhappy in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the whole first half of that book is to try to persuade people. I mean, did you take a little persuading at first? Were you like, wait a second? I did. I there was a you have a, a like a book club list of yeah. questions at the yeah. very end, and I was kind of reading through those, and and one of the first questions was, you know, which of the three deceivers is yours like what's yeah. your what's your baby what's your, that like you were holding on to and and that was so clear like control for me is definitely the way i feel safe like i want to control yeah. everything from you know yeah. a clean house to like who's gonna who if, if i pick up the phone and i don't know the phone number you know yeah <laughs> like i want it that yeah. that is the thing i love yeah. and so yeah it was and you feel good when you are yeah. controlling it yes and your last show with um the podcaster um 
Gaina Lynn. No, the woman. The, the, uh, be, better than good. Uh, oh, 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 Joni Moore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know yeah. why. Yeah. Better than happy, yeah, yes. Better, better than, than happy. happy. She's awesome. <laughs> yeah. She's awesome. But if I was going to debate her, I would say there might be a little too much control, you know. Well, that is so interesting. And maybe and a little too little vulnerability. But but again, okay, I mean, this is I'm just so, saying it's so prevalent. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I wanted to ask you about that because I something that you bring up in the book is that this is, it kind of sounds like you set it up as a, like a maturity thing that like for children, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to learn to have boundaries and you have take to go care through of things that phase, and right. do things by yourself. Yeah. And the, it gets problematic when you hang on to that as an adult. It's And I think you even bring up Richard Rohr and this idea of first half oh, of life and yeah. you're building a container right. and then your second half of life you have that solid container so now you can fill it with your gifts and right. and so what so this is interesting you bring up Jody Moore because I she has kind of been like a um her her methodology for letting go of control has been really useful for me because I think it's challenged me to be flexible to like be accepting of things That's that come up yeah, yeah. that I want to control like I want to control people's reaction and so I'm going to overperform so that I know they're going to have a positive reaction. And you're just for going example. to control yourself. Well, or I'm you going control to control your thought. I'm going to over. I'm going to like be so perfectionistic that I know that they're going to respond positively. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's been so Jody Jody Moore's way of saying, you know, let's let's break down what is the thought connected to I need people to like me or I need people to approve of yeah, whatever yeah. I'm doing. Like let's 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 think about that because. If I can let go there, then then I really am letting go of control. I'm letting right. you know the I'm letting whatever happens happens, and that's like the ultimate peace, being able to just accept and, what what. And comes. I know I don't know Jody, but I'm sure she would also agree that the, the the only step or progression beyond that is to turn over that control to God, and that yeah, that's a, that's yes. another that's in that same direction. Yeah. But but I want to pick up on what you said a minute ago, Aubrey, because it is, you know. I realized really early writing this book, I can't make control, ownership, and independence the villains right out of the gate. Yeah. They have to be a phase. And and it's so, I mean, it's so obvious when you think about it. If you meet a, a 10-year-old, you, you've got a 10-year-old, don't you? We do, we do yes. yeah. You think you're a 10-year-old. If the more the more control that ten year old has, and the more the more initiative he takes, and the more independence he is, mm -hmm. and the more he takes care of his own stuff, takes ownership yeah. of him, the better. Right. That's a great kid. You know, yeah. that's what you want. But now take a sixty year old right. who's yeah. still really hung up with control. Yes. Mm -hmm. And with ownership. <laughs> yeah. You know, and he's one of these guys who says, "I'm not greedy. All I want is the land next to mine." Yeah. You know, I mean, it just never ends, right? Exactly. Yeah. And he goes to his broker, and it's like I, you know, I don't, I don't know what enough is. You yeah. Know? And 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 the independence thing. Yeah. Now take an eighty-year-old who still values independence. Right. That person's in a lot of trouble. So it's, right. We want to grow out of those things. We want to grow to a more. And I did finally start using the word spiritual. I thought mm -hmm. I, I can't write this without. I'm not going to be religious or denominational because the, the audience I'm trying to get to won't read it but spiritual yeah. in the sense of as we age and as we mature, we need higher, more spiritual paradigms. Right. Yeah. 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 Could we could we talk for a minute about control in um, in the realm of parenting? It's in, you've written so extensively <laughs> yeah. on parenting. Oh, and I think a lot of people, especially our age, young families, like this is a hard one. Like, mm -hmm. And I mean, even, even parents as they get older with their adult children and the choices Absolutely. that ad adult children make. Yeah, I think maybe that gets harder. What, what I see is that trying to control children leads to just unending anxiety on the part of parents and resentment on the part of children who, who are the ones that are trying to be controlled. You're absolutely right, Tim. And couple it with ownership. You know, it's so yes. interesting outside the church, particularly where we speak a lot to parents, they essentially think of their kids as their possessions. They created them in their mind. They don't know about a pre-existence. This is my child. I, I, I own him and, and I'm going to turn him into what I want him. You can't think of a more fatal flaw in mm. a parent than that. My son, the doctor, my son, the lawyer, my son, the soccer player. I will do whatever I have to do, not mm. realizing what we know so well. I mean, this child is not a lump of clay that you mold. This child is a seedling, which he's going to grow into what it, whatever he really is. Your job is to make it the best of, of whatever that is. So, and, and back to yours again. So, so if you want to 
guaranteed failures in parenting have an attitude of control and ownership. <laughs> yeah, you're done. And what do you what do you think about the parent though who's hearing this and saying, "Well, I don't want to control my like my child's free to choose their career, choose their spouse, whatever, but when they're making choices that are going to uh, hinder their progress, you know, long term or even eternally, like that's when I need to pull the emergency lever and really step in and control everything. How do you how do you respond to that idea? Well, again, you'd you'd use the parental god as the model, right? Agency has to be there, but that doesn't mean you can't teach and work with and try mm -hmm. and set examples and even I'm almost going to say manipulate. I mean, if you can find <laughs> a good friend that has more <laughs> sway with that child than you do, you'll yeah. do anything. Mm -hmm. But, but it's not control, it's advice and guidance, always respecting the child's agency right. in the end. One thing that's helped me with this is Terrell and Fiona take an extremely long view in terms of, uh, like Parenting. in terms of yeah. what's parenthood and right. what's going to really happen in the eternities. Right. Right. They don't, they don't see, you know, death or anything close there to as the final buzzer. Exactly. They see a lot of, a lot of a room for progress. And, and I couldn't and say growth. that in yeah, here, exactly. But I, yeah. But I was right. thinking it all yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and it helps to think about how the goal is not to be submissive, to not be controlled. And so why, you know, if you have this paradigm of a parental God, then it makes sense that you can transfer that to your children. Like your goal is, is for them right. to be, right. it's, is to have a relationship with God and to use their agency wisely, not to be a good soldier and, you know, and conform. And I know you don't Always. want to spend the whole time on these three on these three deceivers, right. but I, I just just to pick up on what is I call it COI control okay. ownership and independence. Yeah. Yeah. What does it undermine? It undermines our happiness. That's the whole point of the book. Right. It undermines our families. It undermines our gratitude. Yeah. I mean, think about that for a minute. If you control, own, and own, and you're independent, well, who who have you got to be grateful right. to? You yeah. know, other than yourself. I got it. It's mine. And it, it certainly undermines anything spiritual. Yeah. And so, again, I think, I, I thought the biggest barricade of the book would be, you know, be people standing up wanting to debate me. No, I still want control. Owner. I didn't find that much. I found that, you know, yeah, we can see there's something higher. We'd like to move there. But how are we going to get there? It's mm -hmm. really hard. And, and what I kept thinking is you can't just say, these are bad. Get rid of them. These are wrong paradigms. You have to also have an alternative because mm -hmm. you can't just, it's not about the negative of getting rid of an attitude. What do you bring in in its place? And and this is, you look at this developmentally, I'm assuming, right? Like right. you're saying there is a place to learn control and then we're going to add something to it. It's you're not gonna that you're keep throwing that. it out. You're going to keep what you've yeah, learned that's okay. good about control, but you're not okay. going to let it, it, at first it's a lesson and then it, if you let it go on too long, it becomes... And it, an obsession, mm -hmm. and if you let it go, to it becomes an addiction. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people, and you do too. They're addicted to control. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're addicted to ownership. They're addicted to independence. Yeah. And and you want to try to get past that. And so, so you think, what are the alternatives? And again, if we were in the church, we'd say, well, you know, get get rid of control. You want your life to be guided by the Spirit. That's what you want is the Holy Ghost. But what could we say that would mean that to someone that wasn't in the church? Yeah. And and the middle one's a little easy. I'll get to the one for that. But the middle one's probably the easiest because it's a word everyone knows. Serendipity is sort of a word. Well, oh, darn it. See, I just oh, did it. said it. <laughs> oh, I just did we the We can edit that out. We can edit that out. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Let's, we'll get there. We're, we're, we'll get there. But there are three alternatives. Just to intrigue you, they all start with S. <laughs> <laughs> and they all have 11 letters. Oh, oh I didn't I notice did. that. No, that but you did easy. have to invent a well word. Done. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we move on to that really quick, I well, I really want to ask you one more control question. And I want to, I think we better spend a little bit more time on, was on ownership and independence. Too? Or was when yeah, you, what was we were, Oh, mine was ownership, actually. Okay. So yeah. you, well, you're a Harvard Business School <laughs> guy. <laughs> honestly, I mean, that's, I'll let you they ask the question. They trained you for two years to go for ownership. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly. And it, the yeah. the way that it, the, the comparison and the, the comparison that I think it sort of naturally grows out yeah, of it is yeah. the most damaging part yeah, for yeah. me. And personally. the judgment. And the judgment. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. yeah Sorry, you were going to say that. Okay, just really quick. Um, when you talked about, you know, the goal is turning over control to God. I actually feel like this, you know, inside the church, I think this can be really, really difficult. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what that even looks like because yeah. we have all of these ways to petition God 
to change things for us. And right. so I want I really would love for you to talk about how you reconcile the idea of, you know, fasting and praying and and asking for a miracle as opposed to turning over control and just accepting whatever is coming your way. Because those things seem yeah. to be at odds. Are they not necessarily? They really can be, Aubrey. And I, th this is going to sound like a cop-out, over, overly simplified answer. But I've come to believe that prayer, real prayer, real deep searching prayer, is always self-correcting. If you stay at it long enough, and not a bad question to ask in prayer, by the way, that, that may short circuit the process is make your first request, help me to know what to pray for, mm. rather than just assuming you know and launching in. But I think even if you do launch in, I think it's self-correcting. I think as you pray longer, and I'm not su suggesting you do an uh, Enos and you're all night, I'm just saying as it accumulates, you're asking for this thing, you're asking for this thing, you're asking for this thing. I think the Spirit starts telling you, you're probably asking for the wrong thing. Mm. I think it's self-correcting. I don't think the Lord just said, ignore that guy. He's asking the wrong thing. Yeah, I think it works with you over time. But that's a really good question for people in the church because we just... <laughs> or the I guess the negative response to that, and this does sometimes happen, right? If you're too... This, this would be a spiritual example of someone who's addicted to control. And no matter, he's not looking for, he's not trying to change his request. He's just trying to figure out how to get it. Yeah. And maybe the answer there is beware of what you want for you will get it. And then you're in real trouble <laughs> yeah. if yeah. you're asking for the wrong thing, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, we all say this little thing at the end of our prayers, or a lot of times we do, after this big long ask, but... Thy will be done, and then right. we're done, you know. And it's like, right. I just want to add that. It's a little disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. A disclaimer. But, but that ought to be a huge part of the prayer, right? So mm -hmm. either at the beginning, what should I pray for, or at the end, thy will be done, or in the middle, somewhere you're going to get a little guidance on yeah. that, I think. I wonder if yeah. in some ways a more contemplative form of prayer might lend itself to this this type of attitude shift. Yeah. A lot of yeah. times we, we think of prayer only as, uh, as using words, at least petitionary, yeah, yeah. it yeah. could be verbal, it could be mental or whatever. But the kind of content, the kind of contemplation where you're you're sitting with God and not exactly necessarily right. go having a big back and forth. Maybe there's something about that that lets you more easily there. get into yeah. alignment. Go into the Buddhist garden and, yeah. and meditate. Yeah, for yeah a exactly. While first, mm -hmm. you know, and and the same thing, the language, right? What are the the four steps of prayer? Call on Heavenly Father, thank Him, ask Him, get forgiveness, <laughs> and close. Now, how, how about not doing any of those? <laughs> right. How about just sitting there yeah. for a while? Okay. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Okay, let's spend just a minute on on ownership. We we actually did a um, a little podcast with Gainel and Condi who talked about the whole episode was about ownership <coughs> versus stewardship. Oh, did you? So ah. yes, yeah, ah. and it was wonderful. But oh, I I'd love to hear you to talk about that a little bit. And you kind of started with the trees. I thought I thought that was a really helpful analogy in the book that the branches of ownership. You know, if you're not sure if you are in ownership or in stewardship. The, the things you list on the branches are probably a pretty quick yeah, signal, yeah. you know? Well, and let's just, let's just, you know, the big, we're letting the cat out of the bag little by little. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's oh, just, sorry, let, no, no, let's That's just right. do it. Let, let's, no, let, yeah. let me do that and then we'll go to stewardship. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think it's the easiest of the three okay, okay. to okay. explain. Okay. So, so <laughs> for want of a better word, uh, <laughs> the, the, the word that is the alternative to control, this will take a little explanation, but we'll get to it, is serendipity. And believe mm. me, it's not the popular version of the word. It's the real word that was really yeah. coined in a beautiful way by Horace Walpole in England. So we'll get to that. And then and the, and the, the most obvious of the three alternatives that probably takes the least explanation is the one we're going to go to next, Aubrey, that you ask. Ownership mm. just becomes stewardship. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds like a minor change. It's a 180 degree change that changes everything, right? Mm -hmm. And the third one, had to have another S word with <laughs> yeah. 11 letters. Uh, how do you get past independence and, and acknowledge that, no, we're interdependent and we're dependent on something higher? And I wanted to put two concepts together. Synergy, which we use all the time in business, but which is far better in marriage. I mean, you're trying yeah. to become one. Mm -hmm. You want the, the, your total to be greater than the sum of your parts. And it can be, and we know that. So I wanted that to come in because that that debunks independence. Why would you be independent when you can have synergy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the other one is synergicity or, or, or synchronicity. 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 
uh, which is Carl Jung, the the the, the Swiss uh, psychiatrist, uh, the analyst's word, which is sort of a thing about timing and about how we're all interconnected and the butterfly flaps its wings in New York and the climate changes mm -hmm. in Brazil or just how we're all we're all t we're all in this together. And so so those are the three words. And I, I love these three words and I will take all the passion I can. But let's start with the easiest one, stewardship. It's just, you know, the acknowledgement that we own nothing. And this is great because I I've I've interviewed a lot on this book. I've never done it in a church context. So oh, I can really? I can go far deeper on this right. now. I can say, hey, not only do we believe God owns everything, we, we believe that we are really active and hopefully righteous stewards. And that's a powerful word. People say, oh, ownership, again, economically, ownership's great. We had a, we had a, I'll tell you a quick one. We had in, in Virginia, our house uh, there up the street was some apartments and they were an eyesore. Everyone in the neighborhood hated them. They were just always in disrepair. The guy condominiumized the building. Same people. They were just able to buy their unit now within oh, yeah. a week. That place was clean, repainted. Really? Ownership's powerful. Mm -hmm. It's a motivator. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so people have said to me, well, if you get rid of ownership, you're losing motivation. You're losing free enterprise, blah, blah, blah. And I agree with them. I totally agree with them economically. But there is one higher motivation than ownership. How well would you take care of that place if, if you knew that it belonged to God? You would go so much further in taking care of it. How how much how much better parent would you be if you say I, I'm the steward, I'm I'm the babysitter. I'm not even the real parent. Yeah. I'm a brother or a sister. The real parent we we have in common. Think of the difference. Now you respect. This is a baby who's keeping you up at night, and you're mad. You're angry, and you suddenly have that thought. Wait a minute. He he could have come before he could be mm. holding me right now. Yeah. I mean, we're all brothers and sisters. I'm yeah. a steward. What a stewardship. Yeah. One of my brothers or sisters came to live in my family and I have no experience as a parent and that baby's helpless. I'm awed by that stewardship. I've got to be so humble in how I approach it. So everything on the ownership veers toward pride. Everything on the stewardship veers toward real humility, almost painful humility yeah. when you think how inadequate we are, you know. Pride, so, pride or shame, right? I mean, that yeah. that's kind of yeah, how I read exactly. it. It was like, sometimes it's not that I feel proud. It's that I am identifying so much with this thing I'm owning that I, it's actually a source of shame. Like, I'm, yes. and, you know, anxiousness. Yeah. So I love that shift that you, you have to stop identifying with it. If, I, if I love you said anxiousness. I mean, all the angst and all the anxiety and all even the depression is on the side of ownership. You worry yourself sick all the time. Now, now you're a steward. You're doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. You're you're waiting for guidance to do better. Suddenly, you're just you know. I remember one time I was walking in the church administration building and President Kimball. You may not even remember him. <laughs> a short little man. Yeah. It was Christmas and he was carrying a wreath. Oh. And as he walked by, he was looking through the wreath. It was a, <laughs> I looked at him, and he just looked so happy. And I and I knew his secretary, and I said, "How does he? He probably gives six speeches a day. He's overburdened. Oh. He's in his eighties. He's got to be tired. How is he happy?" And this this secretary said, "You know, he he just doesn't worry about a thing. He just knows the Lord oh. will." tell him what to say and well, speak through. I thought, well, I'm never going to get that far, but that's the ultimate stewardship. He's a steward. He happens to be a steward over the whole church. We're stewards over our family. We're stewards over our business. We're stewards over our house. It's just, yeah. it's just I'm so much more relaxed. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So since this one was the one that I felt like I probably identified with the most, and in my, in my case, I mean, I, I guess I'm in a time of life particularly where I do feel like com comparing to my peers, like it is a time when careers are accelerating, yeah. you know, possessions oh, yeah. are accelerating, families are accelerating. And it's like, yeah, there's, yeah. it does. And it feels like there's a, you know, there's a inbuilt sort of evolutionary biological uh, yeah. Yeah. part yeah. to that. But I'm curious how you, what, what are, what practical advice you have in terms of being able to change that mentality? Because I think I've recognized this. I think you've put words to it in a way that are, that is really helpful. But I've recognized this 
in myself before without being able to really change my mentality. You know, what I'm really asking people to do, and we've done a lot of seminars with this, and, and what I find works best is to say, look, I can't, I, I've done all I can to convince you that, that ownership's a false paradigm. I can't say anymore. I've said all I can say, and I've done all I can to say that stewardship is better. I'm just gonna ask you to try really hard for a month to change your paradigm. And, and, and everything, you know, when, when you start going to work, when you think of something, see if you can make that shift. I don't mm -hmm. own it, but I can't, I am responsible for it. Just try it for a month, see how you feel. Mm -hmm. That'll be, that'll be what'll tell you. Cause you, it, that's the whole thing. This has, this is discovery. This is all, on this kind of a subject. All an author can do is throw out some stories and some ideas and some conclusions which i've come to but it's, it's the person's yeah. either going to discover it or not you're saying you, know? you can't control us okay. <laughs> there you go let's move to control yeah exactly I, I, now the control one's a fun one to talk about because a oh, quick story um uh, at the at the business school i had a professor named sterling Livingstone. Mm. <laughs> he taught starting new enterprises and i thought he walked on water i mean the guy just knew everything and and he had a mantra that he would actually say at the beginning of class. He'd say, act, don't react. Never be surprised. If you are surprised, it is because you fail to do sufficient contingency planning. <laughs> wow. You get the picture? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, this was a control freak in yeah. capital letters. Wow. But it wor had worked for him in business, you know. And I just thought, wow, I mean, this guy is so great. Then I had the opportunity to go work for a summer just as an intern in Hawaii for Pan American Airlines, the biggest airline in the world at the time. And I could fly for free. And long story short, I'd go to the different islands. And one time I was on the big island of Hawaii hitchhiking from Kona to oh, Hilo. It's yeah. a long way. And yeah. in those days, it was even longer. There wasn't a... a, mo a Interstate. By the way, what would you call a road in Hawaii an interstate? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. But, a highway. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm hitchhiking, and this bona fide Hawaiian couple, Rusty and Honey. That, that's all the only name I ever knew. He had on a pair of tr faded trunks. She had on a moo moo. They spoke in pidgin English. Pick me up. Off we go, heading for Kona. And and they keep stopping. I thought they had an old car. I thought it was breaking down. Now they wanted to show me something. Come down. I show you. I show you oh, giant lily pads most tourists never see. You know? <laughs> this went on like all day. Wow. And at the evening, the sun setting, we're pulling into Kona. And I, I'm like, Rusty, man, I thought I'd have to get a dozen rides to get all the way across the island. And you were the first car and you were going to Kona? <laughs> and I'll never forget this. Rusty said, oh, no, no, I, I, I was not going to Kona. Oh, wow. I'm like, what? <laughs> Where were you going? Uh, we were going to a grocery store. <laughs> oh my God! I love I'm like, that story. what? You 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 oh, you drove amazing. me all the way. And, yeah. and, and 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 I'm in my mind is st I'm still like a Sterling Livingstone. I want right. to control. And and what he said just like I was on a foreign planet. He said, "We can go grocery store tomorrow. Cannot take you Kona tomorrow." <laughs> oh, so wow. it was the most obvious thing in the world. <laughs> yeah. And That's I beautiful. started thinking now. Now I've got the exact. Now I've got the two yeah. extremes here. Do I want to be Sterling Livingstone? And right at that moment, I was sort of leaning towards Rusty. Yeah. <laughs> and I spent, I mean, I was young. I was younger than you when I was at the school. And I didn't, I wasn't even married. I didn't have a lot of savvy. But I, uh, that this is a quick lead up. The next year, I discovered the word serendipity. And here's, I had to tell you that story. So you'll see why it resonated with me. Yeah. I read it in an unabridged dictionary, and it said this is a word coined by Horace Walpole, who was the son of a British prime minister, and who was in, he was really into Persian fables. And he'd read this fable called The Three Princes of Serendip. Serendip is the ancient name for Sri Lanka, what we call Sri yeah. Lanka today. It was called Ceylon for a while, but he said, I'll, I'll call, this fable was named after the island. Three princes go out to seek their fortune. None of them find a fortune but they all find something better. One finds love, one finds loyalty. And, and so Walpole says, we don't have a word in the English language to express that. So here was his definition, a state of mind whereby a person through sensitivity and awareness 
frequently finds something better than the thing which he was searching. And I thought, that's such a great that definition. Is yeah, I love really it. interesting. Yeah. It doesn't say be rusty, mm -hmm. where you just get up in the morning and pick some fruit off the tree. And, I th and in my sort of elementary mind at that time, I thought, that's the bridge. I can be both. Because remember, the definition says, better than that which you are seeking. You're seeking something. You've got a list. You've got goals. You're trying to do things. But you've taken off these blinders of control, and you're saying, that's a tentative list. That's the best I can do given what I know right now. Mm -hmm. But maybe during the day, someone will call that I didn't expect, or I'll get an idea, or I'll yeah. notice a sunset, or whatever. None of these things are on my list, right? But I will be aware of them, and they will be better right. than the thing which I was pursuing. And I thought, that's just so beautiful. Yeah. And to me, it works for, for these people I'm trying to write to in this book, really sort of type A, hard-charging business people. Because you're not, it's what you said earlier, it's a cumulative thing. We're not asking you to give up what you're good at, which is management and organizing and getting things done and so on. Great, that's great. Just alter it to mm -hmm. where you're also leaving the door open to all these things you can't plan right. and where you relish them instead of resenting them. I know a lot of people that resent surprise. They really do because they can't get their list done now, you know? Yeah. And that's not on my agenda. What are you doing here? Why did you call me? You're not on my, you know, schedule. Yeah. And to get past that and to just say, hey, awareness. And, and, and here's another one I, I like, and I did, this is the only scripture I put in the book because I was trying to stay away from religion for that audience. But uh, there's this wonderful verse in the New Testament that's only three words, watch and pray. Mm. And I thought, that's, that's a W and a P. You can tell I'm a little obsessed with <laughs> like alliteration. And I thought, the W and P we usually use in the control mindset is work and plan right work yeah. and plan you'll get it yep you you can do it you're in control positive mental attitude you can do anything you want which is such nonsense by the way <laughs> and i thought what if you think of the difference if you you keep work and plan because that's still a good thing but you overlay it with watch and pray mm -hmm. it gets back to your question a little aubrey about what am I supposed to do and where's my calling and why can't I do these things I want to do? Just just watch because right. the Lord's probably trying to show you something you haven't seen yet. So see, it gets far more interesting when you say it's spiritual yeah. serendipity. That's just right. another word for the, the promptings, yeah. the nudges, which we and ignore. And opportunities that, you know, that that you didn't Come think. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, how yeah. do you how do you think about the surprises? But this is this is absolutely beautiful and I love it. But there's another side of surprise that could be from things that could be easily seen as negative. Right. Like I didn't, you know, I wasn't planning for that cancer or, or sure, I wasn't planning for that pandemic that destroyed my business yeah. or or whatever it is. So I I when I was guessing reading the first half of the book what the opposite of uh, control was going to be, I thought maybe acceptance, yeah. you know, so is, yeah. uh, how do you, how do you think about that side of things? Because it's not, it's not always just pleasant surprises that you need to be open right. to, right? Well, there is some acceptance in there. I mean, again, I just listened to Jody on the way down with you, but that's what she's saying, right? I mean, oh, cancer, that's a bad thing. Are you sure it's a bad thing? I mean, again, you know, there's something yeah. bigger. The, 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 the three alternatives are all based on the assumption that there's something much bigger. Yeah. that we don't understand fully, but that we have to learn from it. And, you know, it's like, I mean, I, I always find it amusing when some, and we say, I say this, we all say this. I didn't ask for that. I didn't, I certainly didn't <laughs> ask for the, this kid to do that. I certainly didn't ask for cancer. Well, in a way you did. In a way we asked for it. We said, we, we gave up on the, we turned against the one that said, I'll take care of you and there won't be any problems. Yeah. We opted for problems. We chose agency and messiness and mortality. Doesn't mean we love it. And I and I'm and again, I, I think you'd be a pie in the sky idiot if you went around saying everything that happens to me is good, you know, because right. yeah. it isn't. But if you say everything can can help contribute to my growth, yeah, it can work. And I th so it's big things like that all the way to little silly things. I, one of the things I used in the book is 
um, you know, I'm driving somewhere, I'm late, I've got to give a speech, I'm in charge of a presentation, I cannot get through this traffic. There's no alternative routes. The longer it goes on, the later I am, the more angst I feel. And I was, at the very time I was trying to write this book, and I thought, I mean, this is what you're saying. This is not a happy surprise. How do I deal with it? And it's partly the acceptance that I can't do anything about it. And in that case, one of the other things is I was really tired in the third day of a conference. I just found a place and pulled over and sat there and leaned my seat back and went to sleep. <laughs> And I woke up with someone tapping on my window. It had been about an hour, and it was a cop who wondered if I was okay. Oh, wow. And I, I woke up, and I felt great. I'd slept for an hour. Yeah. The The road was clear. I'd called ahead, and they knew I wasn't yeah. coming. They did their best. <laughs> and I, I just remember driving on, and I was an hour late, and I just felt so great. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, you know, that's kind of a funny example, but you can kind of do that yeah. If, yeah. if you if you change the goal see that's the thing i just think our paradigms if you have a paradigm of control it's just working on you all the time you're not even right. aware of it yeah the minute you lose any kind of control it just sort of your your pulse yeah. rate goes up a little and you know yeah. yeah and just by saying no no i'm i am serendipity there's got to be something i can learn yeah. from this yeah serendipity and power naps I that's power the, yeah. naps. Yeah. There, there's a line i think it's in this chapter where you talk about how you your your goal is to shift from control to observation to just yeah. observing yeah. and i like that because it felt like even lower hanging fruit than acceptance instead yes. of because sometimes i think acceptance in the middle of something really really difficult <clears throat> just seems too hard it's just you want you yeah. you just can't help the inner resistance and i like the idea of okay then let's just focus on observing like let's just observe everything everything around us and 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 i think you even make the link that that can really be a doorway into empathy and to real charity exactly and i love that point and it feels so doable in whatever your situation just is just that observing yeah well and it ties back into watch and pray i mean what right. does that mean watch, watch. until you watch mm -hmm. you miss things and you miss that empathy and right. you also quite don't know quite what to pray for but when you put them together watch and pray yeah. i just finished a book uh, strange title um how to think like a roman emperor Okay. It's, it's actually a bestseller right now, and it's a Scottish guy who writes it. And it's it's a book about Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman Empire, but who was sort of the best one. He was empathetic, and he did a lot of things. And it opens on his deathbed, and he's sitting there, and he's dying. And and instead of, woe is me, I didn't ask for this, he, he calls his physicians in, and he says, in words I can understand, tell me what's happening inside of my body because I want to observe it. Oh, I, want, wow. I want to be aware of it. I want to embrace it. I, I, you know, I want to see what's, I want to know what's going on and think about it and observe it. Not resent it, not try to fix it, because I know it can't. I just want to, I just think that's a beautiful yeah. part of serendipity. Yeah. yeah, and so many of the interpersonal resistance, I think, that we experience probably could also be solved by observing. I We just, yeah. um, we had this conversation about hell with Steve Peck and, I yeah. just what has stayed with me is what he said at the very end, which is just he something like I've I've never sat with anyone for very long before. Their wounds open up to me and I recognize yeah. why they are the way that they are. And so I thought, you know, that takes care of a whole big category of problems that we experience on a day to day basis. And, and if it we gets just rid observe, of judgment. It's right. Sort of, you can't yeah. judge yeah. like yeah. you can you when you really, really know someone and understand where they're coming from, it makes sense. Right. And it's impossible not to feel real love. Someone said to me, Aubrey, if you were to drive across the country with a person all the way across the country and there's no, no radio and all you can do is talk to each other, um, no matter how much you disliked and thought you were different at the first, you would love them by the time you got across the country. Mm -hmm. Just because in that case, you're sort of forced to do what you're suggesting we do voluntarily, which is watch people, listen to people, notice people. Yeah. And, and you know, in business, the best, the best ideas are always serendipity. I mean, you know, the, the, the companies don't start through some long process of analysis, uh, nor do scientific discoveries, right? I mean, Fleming was the only guy in the lab that noticed when the mold blew in the window right. and landed on the Petri dish, it started <laughs> killing bacteria, and there comes antibiotics. Yeah. yeah. It's just, 
it's watching. That's why so many of our best ideas are in the shower or while we're jogging or something. Because we're just observing. We're not right. trying to control anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should All we right, move, let's on, move to on to synergicity? synergicity? I think this is, a, I mean, this is a big one. I, I would imagine that there are people that of the three deceivers, the independence is the hardest one to let go of. There is a yeah. even a strong, you know, sort of political movement these days of independence and, yeah. and freedom, maybe more radical than it's ever been, you know, yeah. in some cases. Um, so talk about, yeah. Well, let's talk you about know, that. I'm, I'm going to, this will, this will be a little bit of a tangent, but I think it'll answer your question. I, one of the real worries, one thing Linda and I are writing a lot about and speaking a lot about now is the idea that the family, which has sort of been our cause for all these years, is, is not only um, in trouble. I mean, think of it this way. We used to worry about, 20 years ago, we worried about divorce. 10 years ago, we worried about not divorce, but cohabitation. There wasn't divorce because people just weren't getting married anyway. Mm. And now I think we're even further and people just live alone. I mean, in Stockholm, get this, here's a fact for you that blew me away. In Stockholm, 60% of the legal domiciles are inhabited by one person. Wow. They don't even cohabitate. If they need companionship, they go down to the bar or whatever, you know, keep independence. I don't, I, I don't want to limit my options. I want all my options open. I want to be independent of everyone and everything. Um, so for one thing, that becomes a huge anti-family model. That becomes, um, and, and, and what's, and, you know, I was going to start off today and I forgot I was going to ask you guys, what do you think the biggest <laughs> problem in the world is? What, what's the problem every single person on the planet ought to be worrying about? And I've, I've asked that in audiences and I always get two things, climate control yeah. and I always get political division and further and further polarization. And I agree, those are both great problems. I asked it to one guy the other day, he said, they don't understand what President Xi is doing. He's becoming emperor for life. China's mm -hmm. gonna rule the world. And so, you know, you can think of all these things. I think the biggest problem is that the family is becoming irrelevant and the, without mm -hmm. the basic unit, we're going nowhere. We're going nowhere as a church or as a country, as a world. So what I'm trying to get at in that one is independence is not only, it's not only false, it's the most obviously false of all of them. You're, we're mm -hmm. so interdependent. And if you marry, now you're, you know, completely interdependent and you should want to be. You should, I love the idea of willingly and cheerfully giving up independence for something better, which is interdependence with someone you love more than yourself. That's yeah. a beautiful thing. And, and then when you can add faith and dependence in God, it's even better. So, so I, think, I think people do have a hard time with that until they start thinking of the results or what's this going to yield over time. And, and then what I'm hoping is on the word, and it's the hardest of the three words for people to grasp because it's a combined word that I made up had to have those 11 letters. Right. <laughs> and, uh, but, it, but it's so powerful because we all want synergy in our mm -hmm. hearts. I mean, and, the, and it is the opposite of loneliness, you know? The ultimate extension of independence is loneliness. Mm. Yeah. If you're doing it all on your own, good luck, yeah. you know? So if you get that wonderful synergy, and then if you start realizing you can relax a little because timing is more than we understand, and we can wait and not everything has to happen at once. And it doesn't have to happen in the same sequence. Don't mm -hmm. you think that's important? We, we speak yeah. a lot to, I don't know why, because we're parenting people, but we get asked to speak to a lot of single adult groups in the church. And I find the best, I think, you tell me if you think, give me some advice on this. I end up saying, there are certain requirements for exaltation, but there's no necessary sequence of them. Hmm. You thought your life would be a mission and then marriage and then children and then you do this and then you do that and as a senior couple, you'd work in the temple and go on another mission. The sequence doesn't matter. If you're single hmm. now, why don't you do some of these things that married people don't have time to do now that are essential? Do them now. And you've got this long runway and there's the spirit. That's not very comforting if they want to be married now, but at least conceptually, there's yeah. time. Time is on our side. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to say is that yeah. synchronicity is just trust it, just relax a little, you yeah. know? And I yeah. love that part. I, wanna, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, I'm curious about, back to this independence point, I, 
you know, if you didn't have any sort of a, like a church paradigm the way we do, where we believe there's something eternal, eternally important about families. Right. You know, I feel like there is a movement to become independent, you know, like that feels like a popular talking point that does make people happy that like, if you can take responsibility for your needs, then, then you're not relying on someone to fulfill yeah. that for you. And like yeah. that, it feels like logically that would bring more happiness. So, so it just feels intuitive and right to yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. So for someone who doesn't have this idea that there's something eternal about families, you know, what, what's your case for, for interdependence? Because it feels like I could imagine someone saying that sounds more complicated. Yeah. Like, I'm sure that will not make me happy. Is it loneliness? Like, is that the, well, I mean, the, the easy deterrent? way, it's just the long range, short range thing. I think Aubrey, like you can imagine some, it's pretty easy to imagine someone in their late twenties, let's say completely independent, got everything they want, makes their own choices, lives their own life, doesn't depend on anyone. That doesn't look quite as good in their late thirties. Mm. It starts looking a little strange in their fifties and it starts looking really sad and lonely beyond that and i think i think and and of course it's a deception i mean happiness as we know and as the gospel teaches us is about serving and giving and relying on others and being vulnerable yeah. and and coming together and being united and the independence thing is i think it's the antichrist i mean i'll be honest i think i think the world's dividing, and we can say, well, it's dividing politically, it's dividing in a lot of ways. I think the biggest division, I even entertained this as a crazy thought, but you know, in the Book of Mormon where it says in the last days, there will be two churches only. Mm. And we know that's not a church, that's a metaphor. Right. I, I wonder if it's those who accept commitment and responsibility and family and service Versus those who say, none of it. I'm just me. Hmm. I'm, I don't need yeah. anyone and I don't want anyone and I'm just me. Yeah. So That's you're, the so you're saying more like to be needed, to need other people and to be needed is not isn't is actually productive of happiness. Like it's for your own good Absolutely. to be needed. And to, Absolutely. So, so that could be created in any, not necessarily in a, in a marriage if that's not happening. It could be yeah. in any sort yeah. of. Right. In any sort of role, you, but that, but the the interdependence you're talking about is this idea that you're you're not so isolated that you need nothing and are needed. Yeah, by no one. Exactly, and the the need. I mean, the, you know, again, it's back to the discussion of what we know we're here for, and the ultimate purpose of God is to bring us all back and to have us all united and have mm -hmm. us all interdependent. I mean. I said yeah. to this fe fellow I was talking to the other day, it's not a member, who was trying to explain temple work in a way I could. And it's just the connecting, it's the linking. I mean, the DNC uses the chain link mm. thing, you know, and we owe everything to our ancestors. Now they will, in a way, owe something to us. We're, we're vicarious, mm -hmm. we're, yeah. we're tying ourselves to them, you know? Yeah. So it's the exact opposite of independence. Yeah, yeah. Just, I like how that uh, trickles down into your word, like what, yeah. what that relationship would look like. If your goal was interdependence, right. not, not independence well, from your neighborhood. Yeah, let's have a ward of these really independent people. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I wonder if just in a, a simple yeah. acknowledgement of like structural interdependence could could help. Where you like, have you ever slept indoors? Do you have an iPhone? Do you eat anything other than that which you've hunted or gathered? <laughs> like, yes. like your entire life is already built on interdependence and maybe... It, it, an acknowledgement of that makes it seem like a smaller step to say, okay, I'm also going to be interdependent in my community or in my right. family or or whatever else it is. Right. It to be, yeah. Yeah, because we're already we're already there. We're already irreversibly interdependent in almost every way. So, yeah. so here you're making me think an interesting thing. If this if this had been written for the church, I would have done a top down. I would have said, we have these doctrines. Here's what they mean to us. Mm. You know, I think this is the other way. This is like. Here's some things that actually make you happier. There's a paradox here. The, the, not the ones you thought. They're exact opposite. Makes you happier. And I think over time, what happens is that filters up and people start saying in whatever language they use in their own minds, this is kind of beyond this world. This is kind of a bigger deal. This is a bigger paradigm. Whatever I believe or don't believe, this is something beyond me. I ought to think more about this. And I think it, it will eventually lead them to be more spiritual people. Yeah. 
because I think all control, ownership, and independence pull you away from spirituality, pull you away from God, yeah. make you think maybe you can do it on your own, yeah. and set you up for a huge fall. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I like the synchronicity part of this, of your synergicity too. That <laughs> I, I have always felt like the pace of God in my life has always been like a little too quick. Like opportunities come up right before I feel totally ready for them, you know, mm. and that seems to be like the cadence. Yeah. But I really like this idea of, of recognizing that maybe that is God's hand. Maybe that's just, you know, maybe timing really is um, something that we can recognize as the as the spirit in our life. Yes. And, and I like the idea of just using, you know, making it a principle to just to say yes and be open to opportunities that arise yeah. when you're not quite ready. Say yes yeah. to whatever happens, you know. Yeah. Not, yeah. not that you don't resist it in, in ways that are appropriate. I mean... I have a, we have a study group of people that are all in their 70s, right? And, and I love that so many of them are fighting age as hard as they can <laughs> in good ways. They're exercising, mm. they're eating better and so on. That's great. But at the same time, you don't control it. You, you just you do your best and you kind of come along and, and watch it. And uh, I think the overall bottom line is that the three alternatives – create a peace and a calm in people of any age that is really gone when they're pursuing control, ownership, and independence. And wow. You're a business guy. You live in a business world. There's a lot of competition there. I think that it's sort of full circle to our discussion, the last podcast, yeah. in the world. You're in the world. Let's just be there. Don't don't bail, but just have an attitude. This is an attitude that makes you not of the world. Right. Mm. You know, yeah. you're, you're seeing things in a little different way. And so you're not, I like the, I, I'm going to remember what you said, Aubrey, the big part of this is observation. You're there, but you're also able to observe what's mm -hmm. going on there. Almost right. like you're, you're your spirit observing your body and your brain, yeah. which are your two tools that you're using, but you're not those things. They're your tools and the world is your school. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah, yeah, I love the way you put that. It, that's what this felt like to me at the end of the book, that this is a recipe for real peace. Yeah. That, you know, trading each of these things. So we, so we have control, you trade for stewardship, mm. independence for synergicity. So that, and uh, control it. for serendipity, oh, yeah. Oh, control for serendipity, ownership for stewardship, and independence for synergicity. I thought you were going to fail the test, but you got it, you got it right. <laughs> it you, stopped me. You second but, guess. But that, that I, I just feel like it was a, it's, a, <clears throat> it's catchy and it's easy and, and it's, um, it comes up every day. It's just a nice way to say, you know, to recognize when you're feeling unhappy that usually there's one of these things going on and there, it's, a, it's a quick mental flip to feel some peace. Maybe one, just a real quick anecdote that sort of, to me, cements it all. It's about, it could, the, the, what this is asking you to make is three really big paradigm shifts. Yeah. I love the word paradigm. It's, you know, what's your worldview? How do you see things? And when I'm trying to explain that to people, the best thing I've found is you're, you're, there's a captain of a ship, right? And it's a dark and foggy night, and he's it's a big ship. It's a mega oil tanker. And on the radar, he's headed straight for another vessel, and he's angry. And on hmm. move, change course. We are going to collide. And the voice comes back, you change course. And he's like, I'm an, I'm an oil tanker. You change course. And it goes on for a while. And finally, the last transmission, instant paradigm shift. The other party says, I am the lighthouse. You change course. And wow. suddenly everything's different. And I think we're dealing here with the lighthouse, which is God and his way of doing things. And the minute we recognize that, we change course and we see things in a new way. Yeah. And that's what the gospel is. That's why I want to end there. I'm so... I couldn't have written that. I wouldn't have had a clue what to write in here without the gospel, even though I didn't write it to the church, because the gospel is what makes me know what those paradigm shifts are. And yeah. again, when you know about a parental God and you know about a premortal life and you know about a plan and you know about destination and you know the ultimate goal, you have no excuse really for not living a spiritual life if you really internalize those things. And that's what we're all trying to do. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. All right. Thank you so much. This, thanks for fleshing it all out and making it simple and memorable. And I think this is something that will really help.
help people. It's, it's, it's been really good for us this week as we've read your book. Thank yeah. you. I've learned a lot from you guys, too. I cool. wish I could rewrite parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Richard. We yeah, appreciate it. You. Our pleasure. My okay. pleasure. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Richard Iyer. And a big thanks to Richard for coming back on. As always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read every review and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters. And we appreciate the support. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.